From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Who are you going to tuck in with this fall and winter as the garden starts to rest and we are all indoors more? Do you have any hand-me-down house plants from a relative maybe or plants that you bought that have been with you since college or your first apartment? Mark Hatchadorian, director of Glasshouse Horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden, and I answer yes to both of the above. And he's here to talk houseplants and which ones make the best longtime companions to grow and even share. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Mark Hatchadorian is director of Glasshouse Horticulture and senior curator of orchids at the New York Botanical Garden's 55,000 square foot Enid A. Haupt Conservatory. He's also author of the recent book, Orchid Modern, and no surprise that some of his suggestions today are easy to grow orchids because after all, he's Orchid Mark at Orchid M-A-R-C on Instagram. Hi, Orchid Mark. <laughs> how are Hi, you? Hi, Margaret. How are you? Okay. I don't know what I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm not anything, Margaret. I think I'm tired, Margaret, at tired, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy, and I've got to haul all those houseplants in because we're going to have the 30s this week. <laughs> well, I hope a lot of it, the exhaustion is from gardening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> all so good things. Before we start, I want to say we'll have a book giveaway uh, of Orchid Modern with the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com. Um, so let's, shall we say that you have a lot of, quote, houseplants like thousands in the Enid A. Haupt Conservatory and that you and your team of about, is it eight gardeners, 10 to, is that correct? Yeah, eight gardeners in the conservatory and another eight gardeners in our behind the scenes collections house, which is almost the same size <laughs> with almost even more plants than the conservatory. So you could say I we have a lot of children around here. <laughs> A lot of houseplants, folks. Um, so congratulations on the conservatory reopening just recently. Um, and I believe that also there was the completion of the renovation of the historic Palm Dome uh, above it. Yes. Uh, part of the opening, reopening of the conservatory was the celebration of the completion of the restoration mm -hmm. in which we not only repaired the historic structure, but also had some upgrades to the computer control systems, and our ability to really create the most perfect environment for the plants that exist within. We also did a updated renovation and planting, uh, adding a, almost 60 new species to the palm dome, some really fantastic and outrageous new palms, uh, to rearrange not only the theming, but the visitor experience in there. And it looks beautiful. We were standing in there in the bright sunlight the other day, and it feels like this over 100-year-old conservatory is brand new. Wow. Um, and I know it was a very strange year to have all of you working. I mean, you were essential because the plants were there and needed you, and yet no visitors could come. And now, on I assume a ticketed basis, visitors are able to come in smaller numbers? Yes, visitors are allowed not only on the grounds, which we were open a couple weeks earlier, uh, but also to visit the interior of the conservatory spaces. Of course, throughout what was a beautiful spring here at the garden, it was a real challenge to not be able to celebrate that with all of our ve regular visitors and our members. Uh, but now that the conservatory is open and people can come back, it's been a real pleasure to welcome back our regular visitors and our members mm. because they're the real the real champions. They love what we do and that to see the smiles on their faces and hear those words of thanks and gratitude uh, because the garden provides such a place of respite and sanctuary for so many people and there's such an emotional attachment. They were thrilled as much as we were to have them come back to the garden. Mm. Oh, um, well, I'm really glad. And again, congratulations. Um, so 
we can backtrack and tell people, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago, I don't remember when I called you out of the blue <laughs> and said, <laughs> I wanted your help with a houseplant story for the New York Times. And I sort of blurted out, you know, I mean, it's not like we talk to each other all the time or, you know, we're best friends or anything. <laughs> and I just sort of <laughs> blurted out that, um, well, you know, I have these plants from my grandmother. <laughs> and I told you about my clivia. It used to be her big pot of clivia that was in our sunroom. Um, and then I took it with me when um, we sold that house and so on and so forth. And I've had it, I don't know, 40 something years. And now it's three or four big pots and so on and so forth. And you right away, you didn't like laugh at me or anything. You right away told me about your grandma plant. So tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you rather than uh, feeling that you were alone and kind of a little bit of an oddity, you found out that you had another kindred spirit here. Uh, <laughs> yeah with the plant that I have from my grandmother. I've had a Sansevieria, a snake plant, now for over 40 years, 40, probably 45 plus years now. Uh, and it was given to me in a coffee cup as a single growth, and the plant even has survived a house fire. So if there's any testament to the durability of a snake plant, <laughs> this is really the champion. Wow. And it'll put up with a lot. Please do not set a house fire, but it'll put up with a lot. And what's it grow? It's not in a coffee cup anymore. I don't think, oh, goodness. Right? No, it actually, even though it was 20 years ago, exploded the container it was in. The roots pressure became so much the terracotta pot broke into pieces. You know, we heard a shattering noise in the next room and you kind of go, what was that? And there this plant was sitting bare root with shards of pot all around it. Uh, and we repotted it and it's still continuing to grow. So this plant is definitely uh, happy and healthy uh, and is look probably will outlive me. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of the interesting thing for me uh, was you know, when I took her plant, her clavia, I never thought, you know, obviously decades down the road, I never thought about, wow, this is really a legacy thing and it could live infinitely. I mean, you know, or divisions, fans of it, pieces of it could live forever, you, you know. I mean, it's, if given even half a chance and with the clavia or the snake plant, you don't have to do much, but probably best not to wait till you hear the pot explode in the next room to pot it up, right? <laughs> No, not at all. I never even realized it was that. It was pot-bound, but I didn't realize it was on that verge of uh, <laughs> destruction, shall we say. Yes. So you've written this book, Orchid Modern, and um, it's just, it's so colorful. It's so full of creative ideas on using orchids and, and the how-to, of course, in it as well. Um, and in it, you know, you have, you cover a lot of different species of orchids. Um, and you know, I know phalaenopsis have become sort of a thing. Everybody's got a phalaenopsis. It's become almost ubiquitous. But you, when we talked for the New York Times story, you had some other suggestions, and in the book you do as well, of really easy orchids that maybe people overlook. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite types of orchids that does very well alongside even African violets or a phalaenopsis are what are called Maudii lady slipper orchids. They have beautiful mottled and patterned foliage and that classic kind of whimsical lady slipper bloom. And I find that they're just as easy to grow as almost any other house plant. They're becoming more available than they were years ago, thankfully. And they really are a superb choice for somebody, like the book is geared towards, who has a few orchids and wants to branch out and get something new, something different, expand their orchid growing and their orchid collection. It's an excellent choice of plant. So medium to low light, when you say among other house plants, do you mean sort of it doesn't have to be a super high light environment? No, that... they are orchids that do well in medium to low light conditions. Mm -hmm. And they're actually for people who live in either apartments or have homes where they don't have a lot of light. It is one of my first recommendations for an orchid to try in the home. And the benefit of that beautiful pattern foliage makes them even nice to look at when they're out of bloom. Huh. Wow. And um, are they grown in like bark or, I mean, is it in, do you know what I mean, the medium that they're in or how do they grow? How These are they tropical potted? lady slippers, because they're terrestrials, they would grow in a bark mixture rather than a moss mixture now okay. that you see with most phalaenopsis are being grown in. But a fine bark mixture with smaller particles is best for those types of orchids. They prefer to be kept almost evenly moist, not drying out too much between watering but are pretty forgiving of a range of watering conditions, uh, and they're not so 
fussy that they would cause problems in for the grower. Huh. Um, when you water, I, I always, I probably, every time I've ever spoken, I probably ask you this again and again, because I need more confidence. But do you, do you kind of water, I mean, obviously at NYBG, it's in a different situation, but in a home situation, do you <laughs> put them in the sink and let water run through them? Or do you plunge them in a, a trough of water or a pot of water or whatever? How, what's a good way to water to know that they're f- fully watered when something's growing in bark like that? Well, we certainly don't walk around with buckets of ice cubes to water the plants. Uh, oh, but no the best ice cubes way to water the orchids surface. in the home is actually by letting water flush through the container. Okay. The reason why you're doing that is watering provides a number of different reasons, uh, another d- number of different benefits for the plant. Not only does it provide hydration, but the watering of the plant is also how you get aeration around the roots and you get air down into that potting medium. You want to allow the water to run through the container, watering with tepid water for just a couple of minutes to allow also any accumulated fertilizer salts or decaying organic matter, like as the bark breaks down, to be able to wash through the container as well. So watering provides a number of different functions, and it's best to do it over the sink, let the water run through, rather than soaking the plant in a a vessel of water either. Okay. I will now remember... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I will now behave. I will. I'll behave. Um, so, and any other orchids that you want to recommend that we might not know about that are on the easier side like that? Absolutely, is an orchid that most people, if you showed it to them, wouldn't even recognize it as an orchid. Jewel orchids, particularly Ladysia discolor, has these dark, velvety, almost black leaves with these wonderful red veins through them. They really are one of the easiest and probably best low-light orchids that exist out there. They also do fantastic in terrariums. Huh. So if you have, then they grow right alongside of other house plants, and they don't really need an orchid mix. They'll grow in the same peat-based mix that most of your other house plants will. They have the benefit, although not the main attraction about them, of having little white flowers in early spring. But it's really the draw is the foliage. And if you look up jewel orchids on the web, you'll see a multitude of different species with fantastic patterned, colored, uh, some even metallic-looking foliages. But Ladysia discolor is very easy to grow in the home. And as the plants get bigger, it's one of the few orchids that you can actually easily root from stem cuttings. So you can propagate it as well. And it might take a little effort to find, but it's well worth seeking out and really an unusual house plant that most people don't even think of orchids as being beautiful foliage plants. Huh. Easy to root. That's amazing. I didn't know that. So, huh. I had I had no idea. That's fun. So making more orchids. Um, yeah, it's one of the easiest to propagate. The thick succulent stems sometimes can be brittle, and if one happens to snap off, you can just place it in a container of soil and water it, and then it'll root on its own and continue to grow and propagate very easily. And and what kind of medium are we growing this one in? Like, what would be a good vessel and a good medium? You said it could be in a terrarium, but what what would be any the medium? Any plastic or terracotta container. The plants prefer to be kept evenly moist in shaded, warm conditions. But in terms of soil, they're not really that fussy like some other orchids are. Because they're terrestrials, they'll do well even in a pro mix, a peat and perlite mixture, something to with some drainage and organic matter, and they don't seem to fuss too much at all. Mm, okay. Um. Now, thanks to you and our adventure in the New York Times, I have my first cryptanthus, <laughs> which um, because I needed to take some extra pictures for the story. And yep. so I went to the nearest um, garden center that has a good houseplant department. And there was one of these, I think they call them earth stars. Is that right? Correct. Correct. The common name earth stars is given to a group of bromeliads, plants related to pineapples that have these fantastic, brightly colored and patterned rosettes of foliage that sit nearly flat to the soil level. They're a really wonderful and durable group of houseplants. Yeah, because other bromeliads that I've grown, I guess they were epiphytic in that they... You know, they didn't. They weren't in a pot of soil exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. they might have been in nestled in something like a pot of bark because they need to stay upright. But they had water in their cups, and that was the deal. You kept you kept filling the cups with water and keeping them humid, so to speak. 
Yep. But this is uh, different. Many, many of the bromeliads, like the urn plant, the acmeas, gasmanias, and those other rosette type of bromeliads, they have their water storage as a cup in the center, which you keep filled to help keep the plant hydrated. Earth stores are native to areas where they actually get a lot drier and they don't have that same rosette of foliage. What I always loved about them and found irresistible is that as the plants mature, they produce little baby plantlets at the center of the rosette that can easily be popped off, stuck in a pot of soil, and they'll root and easy to propagate on their own. Growing up, I had a bunch on my windowsill, and I couldn't bear to throw out the propagations in it. They created this little army of them, kind of tucking them in containers of other plants and propagated them in mass. <laughs> Oh, so so they've been around a long time because I, they seem to be sort of an it thing now. I mean, I see them more than I used to, I feel like. I mean, in terms of popularity, maybe because some are screaming pink like the one I got is mostly pink. Well, pink is in right now, and they're very photogenic. And I think the Instagram set has really sort of attached themselves to them beyond the aroids, these colored and patterned foliages. I find them, for people with lower light conditions, easier to grow than most succulents. So they have that beautiful star shape with that sometimes, you know, sort of bright uh, carnation pink leaves. And they really don't, almost don't even look real. They're really a fantastic and deservedly uh, need to be grown even more by houseplant well, peat enthusiasts. I'll give you a progress report in a few months. We are only together for a couple of weeks so far. So it's a newcomer <laughs> for me. Still in the honeymoon um, phase. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. <laughs> I tell it I love it every day. So good, good, um, good. so you just said beyond the aroids that we see a lot of on Instagram, like um, the Monstera, I think, is this sort of ubiquitous everywhere. The more holes in the leaves and more variegation, the better kind of crazier looking big leaves, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, aroids are kind of the it plants of the moment. And People are rapidly collecting them and paying sometimes exorbitant prices for the rarest and much, most unusual types. Mm. It doesn't mean that they're maybe the best and easiest to grow houseplants because there's so many more options out there. Things like gisnariids, the relatives of the common African violet, I am determined need to make a big comeback because not only are they easy to grow and propagate, they have spectacular and gorgeous flowers and foliage and are absolutely ideal plants for houseplant conditions because they will tolerate low light, drying out, uh, and I really think they're one of the great undersung, uh, underappreciated groups of houseplants out there. Well, that was such a surprise to me when we worked on the story together, when, you know, here you were rattling off all these plants and I'm like taking notes furiously, you know, typing and typing and typing in. And then you said African violet and somehow, you know, at Orchid Mark talking about African violets, because, you know, there you are with this collection that has all this history there at the Enid A. Haupt Conservatory, you know, his plants that have been in the collection for a zillion years and rarities and things from all over the globe. And, and you said African violet. And I thought, oh, <laughs> another grandma plant, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you, we see them as grandma plants because years ago, African violets were tremendously popular. They were amongst the most popular of house plants at the turn of the last century in the early 1900s and even into the 1950s, there were entire societies devoted to African violets. Their popularity has since waned as other things have come into fashion, but there's a reason why they were popular. They're fantastic, they're colorful, they're easy to grow, they do well in low light conditions. And my grandmother used to grow gigantic African violets. And even recently, after this houseplant story, a friend of mine called me up and offered me leaves of an African violet that was propagated from his grandmother's plant. Oh. So they're great pass-along plants, and they're fun little propagation projects, whether it be for yourself or something to do with kids. Uh, they can easily be propagated from leaf cuttings uh, with just a few simple steps and really wonderful, wonderful plants for the home. So the few simple steps, you, we take we, we take the leaf off with the petiole, is that what it is, attached? Yes, the, so the stem, stem of the leaf called the petiole. Mm -hmm. uh, you just need a glass, a little bit of aluminum foil, and a pencil. Fill the glass about halfway up with water, cover it with aluminum foil, and using your pencil, poke a little hole in the foil in which you will take the stem of the leaf, the petiole, insert it in so the base of that is in touch with water in the glass. Mm. What will then happen is that a foil will help support the leaf and keep it out of the water. And in just a sh relatively short period of time, 
that leaf stem will start to grow roots and eventually its own plantlet. And then from there, you can once it develops a root system, you could pot it up. And in a matter of a year or so, you'll have your own another plant from that single leaf. Wow. Um, the thing that's so amazing about African violets is, well, I mean, the African Violet Society of America was just you know, it had chapters everywhere. I mean, I think it was founded in like 1946 or something. Mm -hmm. And it's still very active. And they have a great website that has all kinds of details on how to grow them, cultural stuff. I can give a link to that. Um, but, you know, there are variegated leaf varieties. There are minis. There are double flowers. There's a range of color in the flowers. I mean, it is quite an amazing um, plant uh, in its diverse, in its own diversity. <laughs> You know, despite falling out of popularity, African violet breeders have continued creating new colors, forms, patterns beyond your imagination. In some areas like Eastern Europe and Russia where the plants are still popular, hybridizers have created things that are unreal in terms of ruffled, patterned, every color and pattern imaginable. And it's, these are not your grandmother's African violets. They're spectacular, spectacular things, which is why I think it's just, you know, with the right uh, moment, they could really enjoy a resurgence in popularity and deservedly so. You heard it, you heard it here first from Orchid Mark. <laughs> um, <but laughs> Maybe I'll have you know, to change my name to African Violet Mark. <laughs> I know. Um, I saw on Instagram the other day that you um, had posted a picture of uh, a yellow flower that looked, it didn't even look like a flower, it looked like a bird to me. But anyway, it was a relative of the African violet. And I wanted in the last, you know, maybe two, three minutes or so, I wanted to hear about other Jasneriads, other relatives that you're excited about. Well, the Jasneriad family is a huge family. Uh, and have sizes, shapes, colors imaginable. So essentially, there's a plant for every every location. The plant, your flower, you're talking about was a columnia species native to Mexico that was in blooming in the greenhouse. The flowers look like they're stained glass. They have a base color of yellow and with this kind of giraffe or leopard pattern chestnut spots all over it. As you look up at them and it grows easily in a hanging basket, they really are fantastic. Many Gisneriads are hummingbird pollinated, so they have tubular red, orange, or bright yellow flowers, and they're fantastic houseplants because they not only can bloom multiple times a year, uh, but they're quite durable and tolerant of lower humidity that some other houseplants, like maybe calatheas or some aroids, uh, might not like. Uh, but there's also fantastic plants, what used to be known in the genus Primulina uh, or Charita, in which they make beautiful African violet like rosettes of leaves, many of which have silver patterns, and they will produce multiple times a year these beautiful lavender, blue, or violet. Uh, bell-shaped flowers. Uh, I can keep going on for hours. The uh, Jasneriads are just a really wonderful group of plants. And strangely enough, there really hasn't been a book written on them for years. Uh -oh. I Way hear, back I hear a when, book there was a book written called Miracle <laughs> House Plants about Jasneriads. And I think it was perhaps a perfect description of this group of plants and why they never have achieved you know, the level of popularity as orchids or monsteras is beyond me. Hmm. I have to confess, I croaked a Jesneriad a number of years ago, an Apicia. Mm -hmm. um, it was pink-leaved. Of course, that's why I brought it home, because it had these pink leaves. And, and I, I didn't do so well, but there are easier Apicia, aren't there? Absolutely. Those variegated forms of Apicias, although extremely beautiful and tempting, really prefer to be in a terrarium. They're a little okay. bit more delicate. But apesias are relative, they're close relatives of African violets, and they're sometimes called flame violets. They have beautiful mm -hmm. silver patterned foliage, also with kind of chocolate brown or green markings as well. And the flowers are bright, bright colors, pinks, yellows, oranges, and reds. And they enjoy warm conditions. That's where the most challenging parts about them is people wind up keeping them a little bit too chilly, but when they're kept warm, they will grow well. And even a person here at the garden has a spectacular specimen almost growing directly on the radiator, and it's almost flawless culture, huh? growing next to his desk in his office. Crazy. Well, Mark Hatchadorian, I always love talking to you. I'm going to run out now and get 47 new houseplants, of course, but whatever. <laughs> um, 
we'll give some sources. You turned me on to Steve's Leaves, uh, an online source, and some other ones. I'll give those with the transcript. And of course, again, we'll have a giveaway of Orchid Modern, your really fun and really beautiful book. So thank you for making the time. I know you're busy, and I really appreciate it. And again, congratulations on the reopening. Thank you so much. Well, Margie, you know I'm always happy to talk about plants with you. Okay. So anytime. Okay, and Grandma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, talk to you soon. Take care, Margaret. Bye. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. And I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, I hope, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. You can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook or Instagram as at AwayToGarden. And happy houseplant growing meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm-hmm.